one of the world's leading expert on innovation and disruption. It doesn't get better than this. Today we'll be hearing and talking with a real, what I, con I would consider a real American entrepreneur, one that has launched billion dollar businesses, worked with anyone from the Pope, Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, you name it. One that brought internet to US classrooms, one that helped grow pre-IPO LinkedIn with Reed Hoffman, the one that saw the entertainment and consumer tech industry disruption from the days of Napster to today, and the one that wants to inform you that it will happen to your industry and give you the tools to see it come and become a disruptor and not the disrupted one. So, Jay, the floor is yours. Uh, I've illustrated on this slide a few uh, elements of your life. I don't know if you want to go from there and give us maybe a little introduction on you know, what brought, brought you to write the book Disrupt You and think the way you think. Sure. So first of all, that was a very nice introduction, but uh, for everybody listening, I'm no different than you are. I didn't come from a family that knew people. I didn't have any connections. I didn't actually want to be an entrepreneur. I came out of college thinking good grades would get you with a good life, and I came out during a recession, and there were no jobs. And suddenly, faced with that choice, I had to create my own. And what I learned over the years in working with all these people that now become household names and billionaires is it's a different way of thinking, and that's what we're going to share a little bit about. And when I realized that this isn't taught in schools, I, I went to uh, the largest engineering school in the U.S., University of Southern California, and said, let me teach a class called How to Build a High-Tech Startup. And I started teaching, and I had students that had a good idea and got them their, their funding. And the first year, they did $150 million. So it shows you that this can be taught and you can do it. And that's what we're going to try to talk about. And, and the biggest concept that you have to start with is everybody thinks about changing the world, but nobody thinks about changing themselves. And if we can start to think of ourselves differently and all of those, that baggage that was put on since you were a young child, that you're not good at this and you can't do that and you won't succeed, that actually gets into your mind. And the secret of life really is the following. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And once you realize how malleable you are and how you can change, you can start looking at business and industry the same way. So let me first talk about the difference between innovation and disruption. And my favorite example is Innovation, if we think back to cavemen that first went in and, and, and in the Iron Age started making iron tools and they made short little knives and those knives over time became swords and swords suddenly became bigger and bigger and, you know, the Middle Ages and, you know, king and country were all about sword making. And then you have that scene in the first Indiana Jones where he's in the streets of Cairo and the big Arab swordsman comes with the giant scimitar and he's swinging it. Indy reaches into his coat, takes out a Smith & Wesson, one bullet, boom. That's disruption. No one thinks about a sword after that, okay? Yeah. So what's happening today is we're seeing industries that did things the same way in many times, like banking for hundreds of years, are literally being blown to bits overnight by self-made billionaires in their 20s. And this is mind-blowing to most people. So let's break down the self-made billionaire. They have the same 24 hours in a day that you and I do. They're just using it differently. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here. So disruption is when new technology allows things that never were possible before. But what you'll quickly realize is most technology was thought of by somebody that had no business purpose in mind. It was invented to do something that people didn't think about. But once it's there, the entrepreneur can say, wait a second, what can I do with it that people didn't think about? So that smartphone that you have in your pocket, that smartphone is a powerful computer, more powerful than what got us to the moon. What can you do with it? So one of my favorite examples is you start thinking about problems in your life. And if you can think of a problem that lots of people have, millions of people, 
you become a millionaire or billionaire. So there were two young kids in Tel Aviv stuck in traffic. And I live in Los Angeles, which has a lot of traffic or Moscow or everybody has the same thing. And it occurred to them that the phone company knew that their phone was in their car and the other guy's phone was in his car. So if their phone said for them to go left and the other guy to go right, there'd be no more traffic. That was the genesis of Waze. And people go, well, wait a second, that takes tons of engineering, da, da, da. How many lines of code in his entire life did Steve Jobs ever write? The answer is zero. Steve wasn't an engineer. I put the first video on a computer. I launched the first online auction. I built e-commerce sites and technology used by billions of people every day. I'm not an engineer either. You can hire people with the skills and talents that you don't have. The only two things you need to succeed are insight and perseverance. It's so, that simple. Thanks, Jay. So how did you, maybe, you know, there's uh, people, you see pictures here on the, the slides, uh, Sheryl Crow, uh, Bill Clinton, Richard Branson, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, you know, how did you go to, to work with them? Well, so I'll, I don't want to do the, the whole life story, but I'll give you a great example. So when video first got on a computer, it was exciting. We didn't know what to do with it. This was before you could stream on the internet. This were early days. Computers used to be screens that just had text and nothing moved. And we figured out how to chop up a piece of video like a checkerboard and move the pieces around. And we said, wow, this would be a really fun game. What if you could put the puzzle together before the video stops? Oh, we need short videos, music videos. Oh my God, if we got music videos, this would be the greatest thing. So I knew this would help sell more computers and get more people onto Windows. So why don't I get Bill Gates, the richest man in the world, to send a letter of introduction to David Geffen, the richest man in the music industry, to help me get rock stars onto my video game? Great idea. Two problems. I don't know Bill Gates, and I don't know David Geffen. Okay. But I knew I had a winning idea. So I, I started circulating the idea to people that I did know at Microsoft, and it percolated up to Bill Gates. And this total stranger, who happened to be the richest man in the world, sent back then, as before the days everybody had email, a physical letter of introduction. And next thing you know, I'm partnered with, uh, with David Geffen and we go out and get Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses and Peter Gabriel and Ozzy Osbourne and all the biggest acts. And it became a huge, huge game. So the point is you just have to come up with an idea. Uh, when I sold my first company, I wanted to find a way to give back. And I saw the potential of what the internet could be And I wanted to get the internet into every classroom in the U.S. And I started speaking about it and writing about it. And one day I get a phone call from a guy doing a really bad Arkansas accent saying he was the president of the United States. And I embarrassed myself making the most powerful man in the world prove to me that he actually was the president. Because <laughs> it's not every day you get a phone call from the president. And to make a long story short, get invited to the White House. And they said, go do it with one catch. There's not a penny in taxpayer money to do it. That doesn't stop a big idea. You'll find a way. I often say that the more entrepreneurs are better at making excuses than products when everybody says, oh, if I only had the funding my company would take out. Well, go get the funding. So the only idea I had to get the funding was why don't we do an online auction to sell stuff to raise the money? Well, Pierre wrote that auction you know that today is eBay. We had a guy on the committee who was in between jobs had just left Novell looking what to do. He thought it was a great idea. His name's Eric Schmidt. He went on to be chairman of Google. So you suddenly realize big ideas attract big minds like moths to a flame. And suddenly you wake up one day and tons of people that you've worked with are billionaires and have changed the world because you helped solve for others. So the first thing that you really want to do is figure out how you can solve problems for others and that drives you success. Thanks, Jay. I think that gives us a real good introduction. 
So let's move to the next slide where you talked a little bit about this, but maybe, you know, on this slide, what is for you disruption? What does it mean in terms of opportunities, but also, you know, impact or challenge? So the first thing I have to realize is every obstacle is really an opportunity in disguise. If you have no problems in your life, you'll be a horrible entrepreneur right? If you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth, go run for president, okay? What you really want to do is say, well, I have a problem. I now see a solution. Wow, a lot of people have this problem. So disruption is about changing something that cannot be changed back. And I'll give you some examples of how fast our world is changing. And you either get run over by this change or you'll, you'll benefit from it. 3D printing will eliminate 320 million manufacturing jobs in the next five years. For those in the U.S., the number one job in the U.S. by numbers is truck driver. Self-driving isn't just about cars. Self-driving is about 18-wheelers, okay? Tens of millions of truck drivers are about to lose their, their, their jobs. Office automation will cull the ranks of middle management in half. And for those people to go, oh, I am a financial planner. I have an MBA. I'm a tax specialist. I'm in the advice industry. I'm highly trained with lots of knowledge. Artificial intelligence will normalize that out of existence. So whether by choice or circumstance, every career is about to be disrupted. And we're changing at a pace faster than has ever existed. But that also means opportunities faster that phone in your pocket, you are one click away from 6 billion people. You only have to be right for a nanosecond to make a billion dollars or change the world. So disruption is happening. It's part of it. And you can either benefit from it or suffer from it. But the choice is completely yours. You no longer have a geographic advantage of being in a certain city or a certain country. Everybody's connected. You might have an advantage now where your country can employ people cheaper. You have access to something different, but we all have access to the same markets. And the old established elite that could set up government protections for their industry or their business or their nation state, well, look at blockchain and how Bitcoin and other digital currencies work, and they'll no longer be regulated or manipulated by this government or this European Union or whatever. And when money and opportunity flow freely, you suddenly either are part of the solution or really part of the problem. So that's what disruption's about right now. And, and one last second on this of why I'm dedicating the last third of my life to try and teach and help this. When we look at the problems of, in the inner cities in the US, Baltimore, Ferguson, Missouri, it's made the global news. When we look at what's happening in the, in the French economy, the Greek economy, when we look at what's happening with ISIS, from my perspective, this isn't about race, culture, or religion. This is about the lack of jobs and opportunities for billions. We have 2.3 billion millennials. That's more people in one generation than were on the entire planet when my parents were born. There will not be corporate jobs for them. So unless we teach people how to create new opportunities, how to benefit from the sharing economy, from sustainability, we're doomed for having the, the stable type of lifestyle that we enjoy today. Yeah, that, that's great, Jay. Um, I think that's a really good way of putting it, uh, why, why it's important. Absolutely. So one other thing you know, I've read in your ebook, uh, in your book, sorry, which is really interesting in terms, with regards to disruption is ideas don't need necessarily, you talk about in your book, to be complicated. Right, like you had an example about when the computer was created, some guys came up with oh. the mouse or came up with the mouse map. So there was yeah. other examples. Yeah. yeah, it's a great story. So in the early days of PCs, all the best and brightest were coming up with new software. We'll make a spreadsheet, like you know, you know, as Excel nowadays, or you know, we'll come up with word processing. We'll come up with graphic packages. I had a friend named Billy, and he said, "Wait a second, somebody's buying a two thousand dollar box to put in their house." He's going to make a plastic dust cover to go over it, okay? And then, oh, when the mouse comes out, he goes, oh, wow, people are going to have that thing? I'll make a mouse pad. 
And people are going to have tons of floppy disks. I'll make a plastic box that holds the floppy disk. So never learning how to use a computer. He sold his company when he was still, maybe was 30 years old for $135 million, okay, to Rubbermaid. And the moral of the story is each new disruption creates a new ecosystem. And if you think, well, that's a story from the old days or whatever. When you went out and bought your iPhone, before you walked out of that store, you bought a plastic screen that goes over the front for $10 that cost a penny to make, and you bought a case that goes on the back for $15 that cost six cents to make. So there's always people looking at the new economy and new ways where somebody didn't focus on massive opportunities. So, And, and so it's really about also being positive, right? Thinking positive and, and finding ideas like exactly. this simple and um, going about change in a positive manner, right? So next question. So disruptors, disrupted, what's really differentiates, you know, someone that's going to be a disruptor in this new economy, in this new world versus someone or a company or a country even that's going to be disrupted? You know, what's the mindset, how to go about it? What would you be your recommendation? So I'll give some examples from my life. When I was running uh, music labels, uh, head of global digital for, for EMI and Napster came along and suddenly it was seamless and easy for everybody to steal music. The music industry went from 40 billion a year to 20 billion a year like that and never recovered to this day. And you could say, wow, completely disrupted, throw in the towel, give up, you know, it's over. But you also have access to tremendous data and you look at what people are doing and what we realized 15 years ago is when Napster first came out, people stole billions of songs and the next year they stole billions and billions and it didn't make sense because you stole all of the 20th century. You just have new releases. Why would you keep on stealing the same amount? And we started looking at the data and the same people were stealing the same song over and over again. This didn't make sense. If you already stole it, why would you steal it again? And that's when we realized, once people realized they could have access in the cloud, the idea of owning or having something became irrelevant. You always could have access to it. It would be easier to get it from the cloud than to figure out where you've stored it. That insight led a whole generation of entrepreneurs to say, wait a second, people don't want to own music. They want to have a music service like Spotify or Pandora. People don't want to own movies and collections anymore. They want to have a Netflix or a Hulu, okay? People don't want to own cars anymore. They can have Uber. So look at today. The world's largest hotel chain owns no hotels. It's Airbnb. The largest taxi company in the world owns no cars. It's Uber. The largest media company in the world creates no content. It's Facebook. And the largest retailer in the world Alibaba has no inventory. So that one insight of music and how it changed affects everything. So you have a choice. You can, one of the big questions I get from people that work in large corporations and I've, I've you know, been at the top of one with 300,000 employees and I've sat in an empty room and started, but in the big companies you go, I see how it's changing. My boss doesn't get it. We're doomed. But if I, tell him something, you know, I'll get fired if I go to his boss or whatever. Well, if you don't tell him, the company's going out of business, so you're going to lose your job either way. So you can take the risk and get noticed and be part of the solution, or you can wait for that day when the Kodak goes out of business. Of the original Fortune 500 companies, only 57 are still on the list. Let that sink in. So if you thought having a good job at a good company was security, it's really the illusion of security that robs ambition. Because whether by choice or circumstance, you will be disrupted. Thank you, Jay. So let's move on to the next question. So one second. So the impact of disruptive technology. So in, if we talk, you know, a bit about um, uh, in, industries, market, transportation, you talked about 3D printing, the impact on, on job losses. 
the entertainment apps, big data, all those hot topics. You know, can, yes. you, can you take us a bit through this and tell us? Yeah, so these, the, yep. these are some of the big obvious ones that are happening. We're not talking 20 years out or 10 years out. We're talking during the next five years. So we talked about transportation. It's not just self-driving cars and trucks. Those big freighters that go across the oceans, there's now freighters with no people on them. So you don't have to worry about Somali pirates anymore, okay? Uh, all, anything that can be automated to be more efficient and take labor out will be. So transportation is changing. But on the other side of it, we still have to get our bodies from point A to point B. Why is it that Apple and Google and others are jumping into the self-driving car? There's no money in making cars. And most people in the future will not be owning or buying cars. The same example of Napster applies to cars. If you know you can always have one, it's actually cheaper, more efficient to use an Uber or other self-driving services of the future. But what will we be doing in those cars? The cars are actually ad and entertainment delivery devices on wheels. You still have to get from point A to point B. And during those two hours, if you're in the Apple car, it knows everything about you. It knows you haven't had lunch. It knows you're 1,500 feet from McDonald's. Here's a coupon for free fries. It'll drive you through there. It knows it's your wife's birthday and you didn't buy flowers and they'll be sitting in the back seat. Would you like to buy them? So this becomes a whole new industries to figure out travel and entertainment. Your vacation starts in your driveway. You know, what can you consume? What can you do? 3D printing. 3D printing isn't just about plastic toys. There's 3D printing of human organs. You can 3D print a nose that was just used for a, a transplant. 3D print a kidney, which is just used for a transplant. You can 3D print metal and parts. But I'll give you a great example of new industry. So manufacturing, the era of mass manufacturing, of things manufactured somewhere, shipped, gone to distribution center, trucked, going to retail, and everybody gets the same thing, that's gone when everybody can have customized things. But 3D printing can also allow you to take the means of customization down where it never existed. So uh, uh, a reader of my book uh, here in LA had came up with a great business. God forbid your child's born missing fingers or a limb, okay? They don't get to play with the other kids. They feel less than, they feel left out. Uh, they, they, they are, their whole personality and life has changed because they can't get a prosthetic hand or arm until they're in their teens because they grow so often and they're so expensive, $100,000 plus, that they never get one. So this guy just started a startup where he makes 3D printed prosthetics very cheaply for kids, but he took it the next step. He went with the entrepreneur's mind and said, how do I take this product from being something that solves a problem to something that enhances a life? So he went to Disney and he got a license for Star Wars and Iron Man and Frozen. So now you can have this really cool 3D printed Iron Man hand. Now you're not less than the other kids. You're cooler than the other kids. You're invited to play. You're feeling pride. Your whole outlook on life changes. That's the impact where you can take a 3D printer and do something different. Entertainment, we are in the golden age of entertainment because the existing business model of a few companies being controlled, uh, the entire media industry is being blown up by virtually anybody can take that thing in their pocket and become a broadcaster. When you realize that Pootie Pie, and if you don't know who he is, you're living in the Stone Ages, more people watch him on YouTube each month than watch ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox combined. So, so is it the end of television to some extent, you know, with virtual reality, social network, Facebook going live, and well, Snapchat and all this stuff? Te television's a vague word. So it's, it's the end of broadcast controlled that on Thursday you're going to watch this, okay? Um, when you look that, that uh, Netflix is now in every country on earth except three, that Netflix has the data of what people want to watch, so Netflix is creating their own programming rather than buying from the studios or buying from the networks. Google with uh, YouTube Red 
now knows exactly people's viewing patterns and which stars or whatever and is actually formulating new shows based on data. And they can go to the top Hollywood talent and say, your style directing, people would really like to see you direct a movie with this star and it's a Western musical, you know, whatever the thing might be. So we get to the last part, big data. Every industry, I don't care what you're in, if you're not using big data, you're missing the biggest advantage we have right now. For centuries, businesses were run by guesswork and opinion. I think the next product should be this. I think the color should be that. I think we should hire this person as a spokesperson. You can now use big data to slice and dice and see exactly what will work before you spend tons of cycles marketing things. And you see this over and over happening every day. And then you can customize how you're reaching out to people. Um, uh, a specific product uh, just got a lot of attention that when a sports game ends and they know that you're a fan of that sports team based on your Facebook feed, they give you a congratulations from you know, such and such insurance company for our team winning. And if they know that you're a fan of the loser, they tell you, wow, we're bummed, but you don't have to lose on your auto insurance and their success rate goes through the roof. So look at big data, invite it to every meeting. It doesn't have an ego. It doesn't lie. It won't steer you wrong. And you can solve anything from opening a new restaurant to, you know, launching a, a brassiere using big data. Thanks, Jay. We move to the next question. So what about collaborative economy? Are we at an early stage still? Do you see this? This, is the, this is the ground floor. When I get contacted by major automakers that their biggest problem isn't Toyota competing against Ford, it's that no one, no millennial wants to actually buy or own a car, okay? And when I give my, my big speeches, I show a picture of an electric drill and I ask everybody, how many people own an electric drill? And everybody raises their hand. And then how many people own more than one? And I go, okay, I'm going to make you feel really stupid. According to the Drill Makers Manufacturer Association, whatever, during your lifetime, you will use your drill for 13 minutes. You know, oh, I got the Ikea bookcase, zip, zip, zip. Why would you own something and store it and move it if you're going to use it for 13 minutes over 50 years, okay? Yep. If, if an Amazon drone or even a truck could deliver it in the morning and pick it up, you know, da-da-da. Well, we're not going to need tools. We're not going to need lawnmowers. We're not going to need cars. We're not going to need lots of things. We're just going to need access to them just like the music that I described 15 years ago. So the collaborative economy is getting huge. And in that efficiencies changes tons of other stuff. Here's the scary stat for the U.S. When you go to the supermarket, that food, that produce that made it to aisle three, that fruit and vegetables, 40% of that goes in the dumpster. Now, I'm not talking about 40% of food from the field to the truck to the distribution. The food that made it all the way to the supermarket, almost half, goes completely to waste. At the same time, we have people starving and we have people that don't have access to healthy food. You know, huge opportunities for collaboration. So you've seen lots of businesses funded that are the Uber of this and the Uber of that. Some of them are nonsense. Some of them are fantastic. And some of the best ones haven't been thought of. Thanks. So the next question, and I'd like just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, just use the question and answer uh, tool in the webinar or the chat room, whatever works best for you. Yeah, feel free to ask any time during this. I'm here for you guys. You don't have to wait to the end to interrupt with questions. Yes. So next slide. So the, you talked about the acceleration of innovation. So is it really accelerating or is it an impression that it's accelerating? And is it at its full speed yet? Or do you think it's even going to get you know, faster? So it's accelerating well beyond Darwinian rates. We can't compete. We can't, you know. They used to do the thing that in the 1920s, you know, was the last time one person could know everything that was known about math, okay? Uh, nowadays, you know, no one knows everything about anything. It is changing so quickly, and the opportunities and the rate of disruption, 
when you look about the internet of things, when you look about wearables, when you look about all these new fields, the whole medical industry completely will be changed. Nowadays, you go and you have a heart attack or you think you have a heart attack, they hook you up to machine and they say, yes, you had a heart attack. With us all wearing wearables that measure our resting heart rate and our, and our activity level and everything, in the not too distant future, and again, the big data is they're looking at the sleep patterns and exercise patterns and weight patterns of tens of millions of us. So they can say, Jay, of 55-year-old men that eat and sleep like you do, you have a 96% chance of having a heart attack within the next 90 days. Oh, wow. wow. Right? Yep. Every, everything we do in medical today is after the horse has left the barn, okay? Here's a pill because you now have diabetes. Here's a pill because you now have blood pressure. Here's this thing, you know, what if your doctor could tell you with absolute certainty, you could have a heart attack, you will have a heart attack, based on everybody else in society that's like you, you're gonna have a heart attack in the next two months. Or you can change what you're doing today. That's the pace of innovation. Now, the problem with big companies is big companies are like generals fighting the last war. When I was at the top of Sony, Sony saw their competition as Panasonic and Sharp and all the other manufacturers in Japan. They didn't see Apple or Microsoft or Google. They weren't in their business. So that's the opportunity for the entrepreneur. The big dinosaurs are so busy focusing and fighting and competing for market share with the big dinosaur they don't notice the little mammals that have evolved and are more adaptable and quicker. And the other thing, which you don't recognize until you've been a CEO of a public company as I have or whatever, that big companies are so focused on, I got to hit my numbers for the street for the next 90 days, the next 90 days. They're literally, because the life expectancy of a CEO or a CMO you know, is under four years. So you don't have a lot of long-term planning going on. So the opportunity there is a CEO would rather overpay to buy that startup and take the risk of losing money for one quarter or three quarters or five quarters to create something themselves. That's why they'll go out and spend a billion dollars on an Oculus Rift or an Instagram or billions on a WhatsApp. The guy who created WhatsApp applied for a job at Facebook and was turned down. A couple years later, Zuckerberg paid him $17 billion for his idea, okay? He would have given it to them for free as an employee. So the, the, the rate of acceleration is, is both frightening for existing business, but the other thing is, look at your world right now. The infrastructure's there, social media is there, Everyone has a smart connected device and we're getting more connected to an always on. The cost of starting a business is 95% cheaper than it was a decade ago. And you say, well, wait a second, why are these big companies then, these startups, these unicorns raising hundreds of millions of dollars before they go public if it's so cheap? What they're doing is we're entering a world where the smart capital is saying, we can put enough capital behind one company that it becomes winner take all. So Lyft might have a good business model or somebody else might have a better business model. But if Uber has a war chest of a billion dollars to spend, no one's going to fund a competitor. So you get out there, you prove your model, prove it locally. I use an expression called so low mo, social, local, mobile. Prove your thing in one town, one city, whatever. And once you can prove what your customer acquisition cost is and how it scales, you can go out to endless sources. Last year, $40 billion went into startups. You can get this money to scale. And when you take that money, whether you need it or not, it is basically a flag in the sand that says, this turf is yours, because who else would be crazy enough to put their capital to go against you? So it's, a, it's the greatest time. The other question I get from entrepreneurs is, you know, is now a good time to start your business? And the answer is, no, a year ago was the best time to start your business. Now is the second best time. Excellent. Um, that leads us to the next question. Thanks, Jay. So let's see here. 
So we talked about the accelerating pace of innovation, right? So what is the impact for employees? Uh, you talked about big corporations also, you know, are, are employees ready? And how do we shift, you know, existing nine to five employees, you know, looking for job security as you speak in your book to, you know, be maybe more, you know, externally focused and how do, how do we do? Who's the future? What's the future of it for employees? So we all have fresh in our mind the, the great recession depression of 2008. The economy has recovered. Here's what people didn't realize. You know, unemployment's now down in the U.S. or whatever. Of the Fortune 500 companies, they now employ over a million people less than they did in 2008. So they've recovered by being more efficient and they'll be squeezing out more employees. Minimum wage going up right now. Starbucks just opened its first Starbucks with no employees. You use an app to say what you want and a machine makes your, makes your frappuccino. If you think about it, machines are making it anyway. There's a human assembling what several machines made. One made the foam, one made the coffee, one made the ice, whatever. Now one machine does it all. So if you're not adding value, if you're not creating value, your job will be eliminated. Repetitive work. So let's just take a century view. In 1900, the majority of the United States, sorry, I don't have global stats, but it's even worse globally. The majority, more than half of all people in the U.S. were involved in creating food, agriculture. It took half the population to feed the other half, and we didn't export any food. Today, 1.6% of the U.S. makes food, and we export food to the rest of the world. So we've, the tractor was the biggest thing, but we've continued to automate where we don't need people to make food. In manufacturing, as I said, we will automate that we don't need people to do assembly line work. We don't need people to move stuff from point A to point B, okay? We don't need people to process middle management of papers and data. It's all automated. We don't need experts to tell us what the tax code is or what the rules and regs are. So you should be very worried if you think that you're going to have and get that gold watch. You know, it used to be you went to a company in 40 years at the end of it, they hand you a gold watch and thank you for giving up your life. And I ask people, are you living life or just paying bills until you die? And really stop and think about it because it's the most basic and existential question. If you don't love your job, if you don't like what you're doing, Unless you really, really believe in reincarnation, you're giving up your whole life for no purpose. And the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. So there's nothing wrong with having a nine to five job. Just make sure that your job is solving something and you are adding to that solution. And if you don't feel you are, you're not going to be able to duck and cover and ride a career out. Even as shocking as it sounds, governments and public service will get more efficient. It has to, because we can't continue to expand taxes in a way that it goes. And then the last one, which is really a positive, is everybody was worried about global warming and the environment and pollution and, you know, should we have carbon tax credits? And none of these things work because basic economics drives everything at the end of the day. Well, this year for the first time, solar has become so efficient financially, that solar is now cheaper than gas or coal. So anybody's economy that's based on coal or oil, countries that are basically just large gas stations, their economy is over. They're, they're going to be disrupted. And so now's the time for those employees to come up with solutions and new ideas. So, so to, this is great, Jay, and to build on what you said, you know, so if companies need to compete in that accelerated environment of innovation, how do you get to, that's, I think that's the challenge I see, you know, in many companies is how do you take employees to all of a sudden, you know, become sort of entrepreneurs and thinking, you know, so the, so besides, been, besides reading your book. Okay. I've, yeah, well, that's why I wrote Disrupt You and, and, you know, for the price of, of a cappuccino, you can change your life. But I've been an entrepreneur at three major corporations. I was brought in to completely disrupt and change them. And when there's buy-in from the top, 
it's the greatest job in the world. When there's not, I hear you folks, it's the most frustrating thing because you're just going to scratch your head and say they don't get it. Um, the key to changing a company is you have to change the culture that is afraid of making mistakes. If you don't make any mistakes, it's because you're not trying anything new. Success comes from exploring what hasn't been explored and trying new and finding new solutions. When the music industry knew that it was over for selling round things, anybody that walked into my office that had a new idea, I tried. Internet jukeboxes, internet radio, streaming, subscription. There were any wacky. So at a moment, and this was 15 years ago, when you couldn't get a single person to pay a dollar to download a song, a guy came in, Ralph Simon, with the idea of, of what if you sold 10 seconds of a song for $2? You can't sell a whole song for $1. What are you talking about? You're crazy. Ringtones. What if you could make your phone have a custom ring? What if you could make a different ring for each of your friends so you know who it is the second it rings? Well, first year of ringtones did $1.6 billion. No one in a hundred years of recorded music had ever thought of selling 10 seconds of a song because there was no device that made sense for. So the whole point is there's always new opportunity. And in your biggest companies, those answers are already known by the people that they're not listening to. Great. So either take your idea to your boss or go out that door and go crowdfund and take the idea and start your own future. That's a good advice. So next question, uh, equity crowdfunding. So you've heard probably the law has passed that we can now do equity crowdfunding in the U S what is your views on the impact that this could have on, you know, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, etc. So this is both huge and the wild west. So, so let me explain it to everybody. So when you went on Kickstarter or whatever, and you backed Oculus Rift to create this new virtual reality uh, headset, they went and sold the company for billions of dollars and you got a headset. It was against the law for you to give them money and then give you a piece of the company, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, now, with certain restrictions, and you can read what they are in the Jobs Act, you can raise a certain amount of money and actually crowdfund a business. So the good news is it's the most zen-like of funding sources. There are no gatekeepers. It's controlled by no one and everyone at the same time. You can go out and say, I have this idea. Here's my video. Here's what I believe. And I will give you a piece of the company for this amount of money. And right now, one of the news feeds, social news that you get in uh, Facebook is doing the first equity crowdfunding of a news organization. Crazy genius. At the same time, it's not completely thought through and there will be people raising money with no intention of actually building a legitimate business and just taking the money. And that happens in non-equity crowdfunding. So, uh, but what this really means is you could be in Sweden, you could be in Mumbai, you could be in Botswana and have an idea and not be restricted by an arm's length of who you know to get your business funded. You can now get money from anywhere and everywhere, and you're going to see a combination of crowdfunding and digital currency suddenly spark innovation all over the place, and it'll become a very efficient market. Because the other thing is, in all other investing, when you invest in an IPO on NASDAQ, I was the CEO of a public company, there are you know, your stockbroker and your E-Trade and everybody that's marking up and getting a piece of that, all the bankers. So, you know, 20 some percent of our economy is financial services, which means they're taking money away from you off of your investment. Now that it can be done directly, you can possibly see greater returns. So Thanks. very exciting. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Next question. I'm accelerating a little bit. We have 10 minutes until the Q&A. So the knowledge economy, you talked a bit about this. Can, can you expand also your views on this? So again, a lot of it is going AI, which also means a great opportunity to build AI services. Um, here, here's a different way of looking at, 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 at how automated things can be. We talked about Uber. Everybody knows Uber's, you know, what they are. But let me look at it differently. 
Uber has 1 million drivers. That's 1 million people that have never talked to somebody from HR, have never met their boss, have never showed up at an office, and yet they do their job every day. They, you know, if you're a big sci-fi fan, they work for Skynet. Uber could fall over in San Francisco and the business would still work. So if you can automate something as difficult as human logistics, because packages, by the way, when a package says it's somewhere, it actually is. When a human says they're on the northwest corner and they don't know north and west, right, and it still works. So the knowledge economy is going to get very, very specific, but we'll get lots of new big data. So there's huge openings to create new businesses there. Go, go to the next one before we get into questions. Yep. So value chain innovation, that's a topic you talk in your, in your book. Can, can you tell us about this? Yes. Yeah, so in the book, what I really tried to explain and disrupt you, here's, here's a plug, is every business has a whole bunch of pieces from R&D through, through marketing, through sales, through all of that. And what you certainly realize when you look at it from a data perspective is you don't have to be and own every piece of the value chain. There's parts of the business that actually lose money, but you need to do it to do it. Today, you can just focus on where the value can be captured. So Napster released all this value, but captured none of it and went out of business, okay? On the other hand, you know, Airbnb doesn't have to hire maids to clean the rooms. It doesn't have to advertise Hawaii vacations. It just focused on the logistics piece and that's where most of the value is captured, which is why they're so profitable without owning any of the hotels. So once you start understanding how to break down both your internal value chain as you disrupt you, um, then you can apply that to businesses. And it's a key concept to really look at life differently. And there's a great example of a restaurant, of how to build a successful restaurant. And you can read about it. But a guy realized most restaurants have too much food. When you're busy rush hour, two people sit at a table with four people. So he's going to make a restaurant that only has three items on the menu. He's going to force you to sit with strangers. And you go like, that sounds like the worst idea ever. He says, no, I got to come with a restaurant that I'll work with. And the name of the restaurant is Benny Hanna's. So for 40 years, it's made a fortune by solving the value chain equation. Nice. And, and that's a very uh, interesting chapter of your book, by the way, the value chain innovation. I loved it. So the other piece that I think I, I also got from your book, often in corporations, you know, you hear CEOs talk about, oh, we need to innovate more. We spend so much money in R&D, which is most of the time engineering. Do you believe innovation happens only in engineering? Oh, no. You could have innovation from package design. You could have disruption. I uh, give a great example of a company that just changed the shape of a motor oil bottle and became the world's largest motor oil company because you could fit twice as many on a shelf, which meant the store could sell more. And stores measure their revenue by how much they can earn per square foot. So they didn't make a better motor oil. They didn't make a better package. They didn't compete on price. They made a tall plastic bottle. Um, so every industry, and I give examples of how you can, you can do you know, innovation, whatever. But here's the other thing. You don't have to do the R&D. Universities are sitting on thousands and thousands of patents. NASA has a website where you can take any of their patents and go build it into products and people are doing this. So tons of people invent things and then don't have any clue how to bring them into market. And I give tons of examples of people that took something that somebody else threw out and changed the world with it, including if we have two seconds, this myth that Gutenberg sat there like Doc Brown and had this you know, eureka moment and invented the printing press and changed the world is complete BS. What happened 500 years ago in Germany is people figured out you could take an olive press and put grapes in it. it took them 2,000 years from ancient Greece, okay? And they go, wow, we can now make wine with less people. So everybody went into the Riesling business. There was so much wine made back then that everybody went bankrupt because everybody started a winery. Now there's all these used wine presses. And this guy with movable type is sitting looking at these used presses that are really cheap and go, Aha, I have an idea. So he took discarded R&D from a different industry and moved it. And you'll see time and time again, and I've got tons of examples in Disrupt You, of people that are taking the simplest thing. And I just heard from somebody 
in Pakistan, I've heard from readers all over the world, that saw one of the examples in that chapter and went from being out of work to one of the highest paid people in his field. And I was just so happy for him because it was just an idea that just hadn't made it to his country yet. Nice. And, th and then, you know, I find this idea also very interesting. And do you think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities of more collaboration, you know, like crowds, crowdsourced R&D or like because... Like well, yeah. So, so companies don't have to have all their employees full time nowadays. If everybody knows 99 designs, you can get the top graphic designers from ad agencies all over the world moonlighting for you to make a logo. How's that any different than having a graphic department? Oh, the difference is you only pay them the day that you need something. You don't have to pay them the other 364 days a year. And that's happening with coding, with, with manufacturing. You don't have to own all the different 3D printing gear. There will be networks and sites where you can go and, and combine and do all that. So putting these pieces together that already exist, that's the opportunity for the entrepreneur to disrupt. Yep. Yeah, and I think also this concept is kind of interesting also in the healthcare or pharmaceutical, you know, on, on cancer research or things like this, you know, where there's a lot of research done in many places of the world, but everyone sort of operates in a silo. And uh, I think there's still a huge opportunity. So I love this, you know, sh chapter of your book too, a huge opportunity to, to improve and accelerate innovation through more collaboration of R&D. You know, Absolutely. And, and, and looking at patents on Google, you know, you, you can find the patents, right? There's tons of available patents in universities, but it's still kind of ne difficult to find them. Next year, you're going to see Google change the whole paradigm for what a mobile phone is. Uh, with, the, with the Aura is going to be a modular phone where anybody can make a physical unit that goes in. So, oh, I'm going to be out all day. I can put two batteries in my phone or I could take out one battery and put in night vision or a telephoto lens because I'm going on a safari. The whole idea of making the physical pieces something that anybody can snap in, snap out, yep. will, will change this idea of, oh, you have an iPhone 7. I got to wait for a company to come out with the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 9. No, you'll have something that is completely customizable at a local level using a skeleton and a framework that has been open sourced and crowdsourced. Yeah, that's, that's very good. So networking and mentorship. So you met incredible people. You know, do you have any mentors? Have you had any mentors? And what is your advice you know, to go about networking in this day and age? So Reid Hoffman, the, the, the creator and founder of, of LinkedIn, was kind enough to write the introduction to, to uh, Disrupt You. And I got to work with Reid, one of the smartest people on the planet. But what LinkedIn is good for is you can find experts in any field and you can reach out to them and you don't send them a, a LinkedIn, hey, will you give me money? You ask for advice. You start a conversation. People would love the validation that what they've learned can be shared. So in any field, you can connect with experts all over the world. Um, we are so interconnected that there's no excuse for not figuring out. And yes, I was lucky that you know over my career to get to work with so many uh, billionaires that have changed the world all over. But there's always new people, new things that I'm doing and working on. And you can find online so quickly and we're so interconnected that there's no excuse. And, and you can't do it by yourself. You know, there, there's, there's no billion that billionaire that built a one man company. It just doesn't work that way. So, you know, Create a team, find people with, with different strengths, uh, uh, find, find a, a mentor and, and, you know, continue to learn. You know, you have to learn to earn. And if there's anything in the world changing this fast is your knowledge is becoming obsolete very, very quickly. Would you go to a doctor my age that hadn't learned anything since med school? No, that'd be no new medicines or procedures in 30 years? No, you'd never go to them. Why would anybody hire you if you haven't learned anything new? No. So. Yep. Um, hence those uh, webinars also to help everyone get up to speed. So thanks, Jay. The next slide, I think you talked about it. That's an image you use about the Jurassic, uh, 3, Jurassic Park 3 movie about how startups and corporations, you know, sort of uh, don't look at each other. Yep. So I think, we, I think we covered this one. We covered this one. So now the, the slide uh, 13 is, you know, how to go about implementation. So if you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, a corporate executive, you know, so, how do you go about 
thinking in a disruptive manner and launching big ideas, big new products and big new business. So to help you implement and get your mind in this, I've created a workbook that anybody that's listened to this, I will send to you for free. Just go to jsamit, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T dot com and just click on the free workbook. And it's the companion exercises that go with the book Disrupt You. And it really walks you through how to start breaking down the barriers to your thinking, how to implement these and how to come up with that. And if you follow the exercises in the workbook, by the end of 30 days, you will have several billion dollar ideas. And then it's up to you which one you think is the most fun or the most interesting or the most passionate to you. But it'll, it'll generate that deal flow from just inside your thinking. Great, great advice. So now final slides on everyone. It's now time for Q&A. So get your Q&A in the list of uh, question and answers. Uh, this is the final slide, Jay. Can you give us a, a vision? You know, and you, you talked a bit about it, but how do you see the you know, 2020, you know, be? What's going to be, what you, th you think is going to happen, basically, with the, all the emerging trends? So I think you're going to see nation states that become losers and areas that become winners. I don't think it's going to be a uniform change. And I'll tell you the one advantage that the U.S. has as I travel the world right now. Culturally, depending what age you are, you either grew up with The Simpsons or I Love Lucy or The Honeymooners or whatever, but they all have the same story. Uh, Homer Simpson has a get-rich-quick idea. He tries it. It fails miserably and life goes on. U.S. culture salutes the entrepreneur, understands that you'll have more regrets in life for the risks that you didn't take than the things you tried and failed at. Other cultures are very risk averse. They won't invest in a startup. You know, if the best and brightest comes out of a, the top university in India and he goes to his mother and says, I want to start a company, she'll look at him crazy, you know, go get a job, right? So unless we can teach more people to embrace this vision, there will be cultures that lose and cultures that win. It's not who's creating the best college educated. The, the importance of college will change. You know, what it's really about is who's solving problems for the most people. And we all benefit from the entrepreneur because they make our lives easier, better, longer, richer. And uh, that's what excites me and why I wrote Disrupt You and why um, I'm so humbled by the impact it's had on people around the world and in all the languages it's now available in. So open for questions, free advice. And Yes, so the question, so I'm going to read one from Mark Gonzalez. So if you have more than one idea that you're passionate about, do you recommend pursuing all at the same time or just focus on one at a time? So on the e-commerce, so the question is, what's going on with e-commerce? Where's the excitement? So the real excitement in, in e-commerce right now is customization. So whether it's 3D printing, whether it's just-in-time manufacturing, whether it's everybody with their, you know, using big data to make a t-shirt business on, on, on Facebook, it's all no longer about mass market. It's about making niche products that the friction and the cost to get an aggregated niche market is very simple. Uh, so you'll see more and more of that and go where people's passions are because their wallets will follow their passions. Great question. Great. And Jay, the question, so you caught one question. I didn't catch it. This one It's in the chat, but the questions are also in the Q&A. You, can you see the Q&A? Uh, um, so, I, do, I do not see the Q&A. So, so, read, so, so read, me, yes. read me a question. So, so one question here is what recommendation do you have for angel funding options for startups? Okay, so, so I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for startups. And let me tell you the thinking process that people go at. The first round of angels is you have to go to people that know you. Even if, if it's just small dollars, it proves the people that know you trust you. Okay. Second is go for people that would benefit, that would want to become customers. So when Ray Kroc came up with the idea of fast food at McDonald's, nobody wanted to lend him money. The idea of, of a fast restaurant didn't exist. You sat down with your family, a waitress brought you stuff that just didn't exist. So he went to the meat suppliers and said, if I'm right, this works. When Fred came up with the idea for FedEx, okay, he wrote it as a, as a business school paper. 
He got a low grade on it. They said it was stupid, but he saw an airplane manufacturer had a bunch of planes that they got a canceled order on and said, if this works, we're going to become a big customer of planes. So they backed them. So look at strategic money. I have a whole chapter in Disrupt You on OPM, other people's money. There are people that are willing to give you money in your startup that don't want equity and don't want you to pay it back. And I give examples where I've gotten 60 and $80 million from people that don't want the money back and don't want equity. Yep. Next uh, question. Thanks, thanks. So next one, you spoke at the beginning that before thinking of solving a problem, we need to think of changing ourselves. What does that exactly mean in terms of disruption? So self-disruption is like uh, plastic surgery, except you're holding the scalpel. There are things that are holding you back from taking these risks. There's our... our you know, parents, teachers, and well-wishers that told you you're not good at math, you're not good at public speaking. You've taken one of those Myers-Briggs complete BS tests that say you have this personality. No, you don't. You had that personality yesterday. Today, you can have any personality you want. Um, so it's really about getting out of that mindset that's been drilled into us. Our whole educational system was designed to create factory workers, to give you enough math and enough reading to go work for somebody else. So you either have reached that point in life where you realize I'm going to spend my entire life making someone else's dream come true or I'm going to work on making my dreams come true. Next question. Next question. So Jeff here is asking, he's, he has a question about disruption and innovation in highly regulated and capital intensive industries. There seems to, to have to be significant variance in the level of innovation across industries and markets. What factors contribute to this and how do you overcome these barriers in environments that have a powerful status quo? I got 304 pages that answer that, but I'll try to do the short version. That's, a, a, that's really the driving question behind this book. In industries that are highly consolidated, they actually don't want innovation. There's a basic premise of, we'll do it. So the example, Kodak. Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975. For many people listening, you weren't born yet, okay? They never came out with it. Why? Because the guy in charge of the film division, film had an 80% margin. They owned film. Why would they want to cannibalize their own business? So whoever was in charge of that in the company, basically their career was over. What Kodak didn't realize is a good idea will come, whether Kodak likes it or not. And now the 100-year-old Kodak company, all gone. So different industries have barriers set up. Certain governments tax dollars going into startups as a way to prevent new innovation and new rich people because the people that are in charge want to keep it that way. All those barriers are malleable. You can change them. And we try to show you how, but great question. Thank you. So people tend to say now, uh, so wait a minute. If you have more than one idea that you're passionate about, uh, should you work on all of them at the same time or focus? Okay. So you're in an elevator. The doors open. Richard Branson walks in there and he says, I like you. Today I'm putting a million dollars in a new business. Which, what business would you like me to put it in? And if you start rattling off a whole list, no. It is so hard to get one company off the ground. There's no way you can do two or three at the same time. You're really going to have to say, this is the one, because success isn't guaranteed. And you're going to have to really work hard. And every major success had a pivot moment where it looked like the end was near. And if you're not willing to stick with it on that one idea, you won't get to the finish line. And again, I, if we had time, I'd give you lots of examples of businesses that you know today that actually grew out of the ashes of a failed idea. Great. So next question. So disruption is hard in regulated industry like healthcare. How would you go about doing this? So I'm not going to give legal advice or medical advice for all the obvious reasons, uh, but there's a broad category of healthcare. Okay. So creating wearables, you know, uh, creating diagnostic. I mean, if you really think about it, your Fitbit, your, your up, those are medical devices. They're really about changing your cardiovascular and being able to measure or monitor, but they're not making medical claims. Okay. If you have a 
better way to test blood or better way to do this, you know, you're really going to have to go through the regulatory process. Just as when I was chairman of a crowdfunding company, it was very, very successful, but we had to go through everything that the SEC requires, the Securities and Exchange Commission, because you have to follow the laws. Now, the challenge is laws trail technology by 20 years. So, you know, you're going to be slowed down by those processes, but it won't stop you. Great. So thank you, Jay. Next question here. So we're going to take the final question, guys. So put them in. So someone is asking, um, except for LinkedIn, is there any other way to network and find a mentor? Oh, absolutely. So the best way is to go to conferences, trade shows, gatherings in your field or your field that you're interested because that's where you get to meet thought leaders. That's where you get to meet doing something. Um, when I had my first startup, a little software company that no one ever heard of, at the big trade shows where the big giant companies, the Microsofts and everybody were, we had a teeny little booth at the smallest end where nobody went to. And the guy who came to visit us was a sales guy who was looking for what's the next product that he could sell. He knew sales, but he didn't know technology. And he became, you know, my national rep. So there's always a place where there's people seeking. That's why so many conferences exist. You will not change the world sitting at your desk. You have to get out there and meet people and do, um, you know, I, I've, you know, this year spoke in, I think, 12 countries and 26 states this year. And I'm always being exposed to new ideas and new things. I wish I could pursue all of them, but things that I would have never run across had I not taken the time to see the person with the next crazy idea. Thanks. So the next question is about the Hyperloop transportation technology. So have you heard about it? And is it science fiction or reality? What's your so, so I know Elon Bebop, who runs one of them, is, is a dear friend. The, the other one's here in, in building a test track. So the science behind it is sound as can be, maglev and, and, and vacuums and combinations thereof. The real challenge is mass public transportation involves government and billions of dollars. So the first one is the hardest one to get off the ground. But when you realize how bad and ancient the infrastructure is in many countries, if you can find the one country that it can change their whole economy by doing this more efficiently, by promoting tourism, by doing all kinds of things, you'll suddenly then see it snowball. So yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great means of transportation and very efficient and uh, I'm very bullish on it. So I want to thank everybody for sharing their most precious resource with me today, which is their time. Um, again, I'm, I'm not pushing the book uh, for me. I'm, I'm really spent the time to try to help as many of you and I'd love to hear from you. You can go to follow me on Twitter for daily motivational advice and insights about disruption at Jay Samet. And again, I want to thank you for inviting me uh, on the startups uh, uh, chat today.